<laughs> I was on the dyno late last night. Um, had some excitement. <laughs> Something that was unplanned. Um, unfortunately for me, I came out to, while I was testing, I needed to go get some more fuel. So I was going to run down to the local gas station and get some more fuel. <clears throat> and I came out and allowed the door to the shop to close. The problem with that is that my keys to the shop were still inside. <laughs> and so it's like, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night or something. I'm standing outside the shop by myself. No keys. No keys in my truck. The phone's also inside sitting next to my keys. So I'm stranded. <laughs> so I decided, well, I can't get into my truck to, you know, grab a hold of something that maybe I could try to open the lock with, but that's not going to happen. Um, I'm no, I'm no locksmith. Uh, so I, I instead um, decided, well, I got to make something happen. So I took the, uh, did the five mile run. I took off and ran five miles over to Mark Sanchez's house and um, got Mark and we got a hold of Troy and he came back down to reg rescue me and get the um, get the shop open back up. So that was a little nice little adventure, nice little time waste for me. You know, important lesson: keep all your stuff with you. And don't allow the door. So that meant that last night was a long, long night, <laughs> like two thirty. So the the upshot of all that is though is I got to run the. We finished testing. We I finished testing the M90 on the 5.3, the ported M90 from the guys at Jokers, and that did, did very well. So that you'll see you guys a full. There'll be a full video coming up on that on all the testing on the ported blower. And also, I was able to run some intake manifold tests last night. I ran the carbon PTR manifold. So you think it's like a tunnel ram style manifold with a very very cool. And I'm not showing it in a thumbnail. The thumbnail I'm showing what's inside because you know what's inside. That's what's important. I'm showing you the stacks inside, but it has a cool lid that's chock full of carbon fiber goodness and ability goodness too, all in one, because the carbon fiber lid also has a billet aluminum throttle body mount that's, I think that they um, epoxied that to the, to the carbon fiber. And so the carbon fiber lid bolts down on top of the lower manifold and the lower manifold contains the runners and the cool thing about that manifold, in addition to it having carbon fiber goodness and ability goodness, is that it has adjustable runners. So my favorite type of intake manifold is an adjustable one, so that you can, <laughs> so that we can play with it, because it's more than one manifold essentially. I mean, you can take and change the runner length. Now it's not dramatic; it's a it's a few inches, I think, or at least a couple inches. But you can, and what I did last night is we ran the when the manifold is shipped the way that they shipped it to me is that it had the longest runners in it and we ran that and which is a good choice for this 5.3 even though we had a pretty big camshaft in it and very good ported heads on this particular man on this particular 5.3 it had the trick flow as cast 220s that were ported by the guys at brian tooley racing and they did a great job and it also had a brian tooley camshaft in it it had the big stage 4 ls3 camshaft which allows this thing especially with a short runner manifold to make power at a very high engine speed. So this PTR intake manifold, the adjustable one, you know, fit into that category along with the high ram and others. And certainly the BTR, uh, the short runner BTR Trinity manifold that we did re really wanted to rev out there. But this one was cool because we could run it with the long runners the way that they shipped it and do all the tuning and stuff. And then we could, then we could just go in and unbolt the lid, take the lid off, take the runners out and the the at, at first I was a little <laughs> I wasn't sure how to remove the runners because then I couldn't find instructions anywhere but it turns out that it's very easy now I knew that they I knew because they have um, I could see from the other runners that they have little posts on them so I knew that it went in and kind of locked itself in place and the way that they secure that because you it goes in and locks itself in place but the way that they secure that is that it has O-rings in it. So the O-rings, when you when you lock it in place, you slide the O-rings over that assembly, and that takes up all the gap basically, and it just pushes the the um, pushes the stack, the new stack, into its proper position and holds it there for vibration and stuff, so that it doesn't vibrate loose. Otherwise, it would be it would be a loose fit. So that's kind of a cool and genius deal the way that they did it, and. It 
a lot faster than changing to a whole different intake manifold. So it was cool to be able to get on, <laughs> even though this was happening late at night because I'm an idiot. Um, it was cool to get the different runners on there. I tried the longest one and the shortest one, and then by that time it was too late. I kind of wanted to try the middle one, but we know what that does. If you if you see what the difference is between the long one and the short one, and the and you and you test the middle one, it's right in between those two, just just like you would expect. You can, if you want, and, and I've done this in the past. I did it with the fast manifold that they make an adjustable one. In the past, I have, you know, you mix and match different lengths to try to see what's happening. Like we, we what we did when I did the fast manifold is we tried to make the, the outer runners longer and then the inner runners shorter, kind of like you see on, very typical on most single plane intake manifolds. So we tried to make an EFI version of a single plane manifold. But in the end, it just, it, it ran best with the long runner manifolds <laughs> with all of them when they were all the same. It, it had the best power curve. You think, oh, well, we could get all of the, the bottom end of the long runner manifold and all the top end of the short runner manifold, except you don't get that. All you do is lose some of the power from the long runner manifold. And so that didn't work out in the fast, but this was cool last night. Um, I like the, I like these carbon PTR intake manifolds. I'm, I'm sure that they're pricey, <laughs> but if you open the hood, um, assuming that you have a hood that that, that style manifold will fit under, it, it obviously is not going to fit in a Camaro or a Corvette, but if you have that style manifold, I mean, you, you pop the hood on that, you're, everyone would be, you know, like, yeah, that looks nice. Your, your engine, even this engine, that's a junkyard five, three, at least the bottom end is immediate looks like a, it, it immediately looks like a SEMA show engine. <laughs> so it did well, but the, and I'll, and I'll, I'm doing a video on this on the, on the whole results of this test. The thing that I liked is the, the, the ported heads, the trick flow heads allowed us to use this kind of manifold on a five, three, really this manifold I think, um, it, it would be a better choice. I mean, if you're going to run this kind of manifold or, or a high ram or uh, the Trinity or any of these, you're going to want to be making power. You're going to want to be revving this motor fairly high, especially on a 5.3. Now on a 6.0, that comes down or a 6.2, you know, or, or a 4.08 or a 4.16. Then then the manifolds, I think, are um, a better choice because it, it brings the active RPM range down a little bit. But you can alter that from changing the runner length, which is very, very cool. So the the shorter runner did indeed prove improve peak power. It did indeed de low, uh, lose low speed power. But the interesting thing is it didn't lose anywhere near what I thought it would um, given the change in runner length. It wasn't dramatic, but I was just expecting a little bit more low speed power. But again, that's probably because we're looking at a 5.3 with a very big camshaft in it. And... It's just maybe not as sensitive. And I think we were starting to run at probably 32 or 3300 or something. Because we're making a fairly long sweep. We're going to 7500 or something. But, it, and it's cool, that <laughs> that poor motor. <laughs> I, need to, I need to count and see how many runs we have on it now after this latest test session. But I'm, I'm sure it's a lot. I'm sure that... I'm sure that, it, that I'm given all of the blower runs and then the intake manifold runs I'm, I'm sure it's got to have 75 or 80 more pulls on it and so <laughs> this is for all the guys that think oh you're just gonna wear that motor out on the dyno no it's already worn itself out it's in in whatever it did in its regular life in its civilian life you know it, it, it i'm sure it had 100 or maybe 200 i don't know it, it, it had a lot of miles on it and then we just put it on the dyno still works still runs good still works it's it's all fine. The one thing I can say is that this, after running a bunch of V85 in this thing, the oil, the oil pressure is starting to get a little bit low on some of the runs. So we, it, it's definitely a need of an oil change because the oil gets contaminated because this thing does have some blow by because it's old and tired. It definitely needs an oil change because it's contaminated with the E85. So it's time to you know it's time to <laughs> time to give it at least a little bit of love. But this is a good little. This is a good little 33. I'm I'm very happy with it. This is uh, you know, one of the better motors I've got from the wrecking yard. Now it needs to, it, it really kind of needs to come apart and be cleaned, and then put back together with rain gap and stuff, and 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 kind of be a real motor. <laughs> Look, I'm a real boy. Let's see what you guys got going on today. Hopefully, you guys all had a good Easter. I I spent mine <laughs> running from the shop. 
Uh, it was good. Funny bike, what's going on? Dr. Dab, West Virginia. Reporting in, nice. Adjustable manifold. Happy Easter. Good afternoon. Tim, I don't have any pizza today. What? Where's the pizza love? I love the shorter runners for lower torque on my combination to save the axles. Oh, okay, so you want to make less power. You actually want to make less power down low so that you so that you don't hurt stuff. That's good. It will do that. A lot of times you have to tailor the boost curve, take timing away, you know, all that stuff for, for traction control to try to get the thing to, to not break stuff. That's a good situation. If you have excess power and, and excess, um, <laughs> I know Oregon, so it looks like a, um, if you have excess traction and excess power and you're worried about breaking things, that's good, right? That's good stuff. Good stuff. That's right. Today is April Fool's. Huh? I should have I should have posted something and said I ran seven blowers on the <laughs> seven M90 blowers. I should have just reposted my my blower video where I said that the M90 was too small. I do need to come up with something, right? I mean, it is. It, it is still April Fools and I'm pretty foolish so it should be good. Todd, I know several lobes on the cam had some damage caused from lifters. I'll disassemble the engine today and send you pictures. Hopefully you can tell me what and how it became damaged. Uh, damage to the cam lobe. Um, Coil bind on the springs is really common. I got a bird walking on the back of my truck. What's up, dog? Uh, spring clearance, that can be bad. If your uh, valve float can do that. Insufficient oiling. Unstable cam profile. I think, Todd, didn't you put a sloppy stage two in that? Sloppy stage deuce. It's advancing timing until it pings. You mean a... a a static timing test or is this under load I I don't think that that's an accurate way unless you're advancing it until it pings under load and then is it are you getting detonation where are you getting detonation? Are you getting detonation when you first stomp on the gas? Are you getting detonation at the torque peak? Are you getting it at the power peak? What's happening? Could it be that the machine shop did install my high performance spring? It's a sloppy stage two. I, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to look at it and see. If it, you, you should be able to tell that it has uh, a stock beehive spring, if that was originally an LS2, um, they'd probably be blue or, or yellow, maybe. And a sloppy stage two definitely won't work with those springs. Or if they're old looking, they could have used even worse. I mean, they could have used, um, could have used like 706 or 862 springs, which are really only good for around 500 lift. That would put a lot of wear on the camshaft if you're if you're running into coil bind. Hopefully it didn't get too much material in the motor. There's a bunch of different colors on the stock springs, Todd. 
yellow, blue, spring color. Something I heard bird song say about timing his engines. If if you can go out and get a load and not hear that de that de 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 detonation, the problem is you have audible detonation and inaudible detonation. So if you run till it's detonating and then back it off till you don't get detonation, as long as you back it off enough to get rid of the audible detonation and inaudible detonation, and then did you back it off enough to uh, have it not detonate under all conditions, like under summer days when it, when it's hot, under cold days, um, what and then also what is the timing curve like? Like how quickly is it coming up? Is it a carbureted distributor thing? What's the what's the initial timing? What's the total timing? My free L86 had a hole in the block. <laughs> I guess that's why it was free. <laughs> so basically, you got a, a free coffee table then. But that's okay. Those are good too. We like coffee tables. A little transport rig pulling the trailers around. Lots of warehouses up in here. How will I, how will I be able to tell it? You can send me pictures of the springs. I might be able to tell, but. The only way to tell about coil bind is for me to take the spring off and measure it at West Tech and see what the uh, spring coil bind's at and then see what the installed height is and see what the lift is on the cam and just do the math on it. I mean, we could spin the motor over, but a lot of times, especially if you get into coil bind, you just start depressing the lifter. Because when we're doing that on the stationary thing, on the static setup, there's no oil pressure in the lifter, so it's not going to hold the lifter up. The the spring, especially. And you don't want to get into that nonsense. That definitely hurts stuff. I know the cam is messed up. I can see it from the lobes. You want me to just leave it home and then let you tear it down? Just, just take the valve cover off and send me a picture of the spring. I got free scrap aluminum. I'm sure the entire thing is trash, so maybe I can save the heads. Yeah, if it's an L86, and if it's an L86 and it has the heads and the intake manifold on it, both of those are desirable. Mike! What do you think about running two Edelbrock VRS 750 carbs on a tunnel ram for a 42670? I think that's a good idea. Those are really good carburetors. I'm I'm a big fan. Yeah, Banks, if you um finding out what kind of timing the motor wants without detonation. At the drag strip, if you can make changes in timing of one or, or like two, I'd make it in two degree increments and then make another pass. The problem with doing it at the drag strip is you got to factor in a lot of other things. Did did the track temperature change? Did the outside temperature change? Did your trans temperature change? You know, did change in mile an hour? Um, and everything that you change is timing that tells you. If you ever testing LT stuff again, I have the intake for sure, and maybe heads if you get it. Thanks. I, I think I probably won't be testing any LT stuff here, but um, we will at Brian's. 300cc intake ports are massive. Yeah, but they flow really well, especially in ported form. They work really well. And the nice thing about the LT is all they have to flow is air. So they, relatively speaking, even more. I remember having an argument with a guy about port injection versus direct injection, and I told him I was adamant <laughs> about port injection making more power, and it seems as though I was incorrect. So if I can't remember his name, it was somebody that I hadn't, hadn't met before that came into West Tech. Um, and so whoever you are, I, I apologize. I was wrong. I forgot about the airflow thing. Airflow versus charge cooling. 
Obviously, it'd be better to have both, but... I want to see how the L L83 heads work on the 6.2. They don't make as much power on a 6.2 as, as a... Um, as a L as a six two head does. I think Brian has tried that. I think they tried that at Brian Tully Racing. And the LT1 camshaft and the L86 camshaft is, is definitely an upgrade for the L83. Not as much as an aftermarket cam, but, but the L83 cam is pretty mild. Just like the 5.3 cam. Like old Betsy here. <laughs> the LM7. The race LM7. I'm assuming the engineers do what they're doing. Yeah, they're pretty good. And I think that the L86 and LT1 share the same camshaft and heads and stuff. I think that the intake manifold and the tuning is the only difference. Let's go to go to live chat. Yeah, Todd, just take the valve cover off and send me a photo of that spring to start out with. I'm, I'm concerned that the... Um, concerned that the cam is worn like that. I hope there's not a bunch of material in it. What's a good break-in procedure for a 5.3? Before we even start it, and we had put um, assembly lube in the oil pump, we fill it with oil, we seal everything, then I pressurize the, we don't have the spark plugs in it, I pressurize the crankcase, and with one or two PSI, we force oil up into the pump, and then we spin it on the dyno so that the oil pump grabs and then we make sure it has um, oil pressure. And then after that, then we start it and then we run it through a computer controlled break-in procedure or you could do it manually. All I'm doing is we're varying the RPM and the load and basically we're varying the RPM by load. So the, this thing runs from let's say 2,500 to 3,500 and um we're just and then we and then we alter the load it it loads it from let's say 50 foot pounds to 90 foot pounds and then just holds it at, at that loaded point for 10 seconds and then goes back down to the other load point for 10 seconds and then and, and cycles through that and we do that for usually for two break-in cycles, each one of them are 10 or 15 minutes a piece. And then after that, then we run it on the dyno. And it's still really breaking in when we do it on the dyno. But for in the car, I would just drive it around easy for, I, I know I was always told 500 miles. I don't know that many guys are going to do that. Some guys say, oh, no, you got to you just take it out and run hard, break it in hard, and it runs hard. That That's not been my experience. Um, it's it's less of an issue with a hydraulic roller cam deal. All you're doing is like seating the rings. Now that I think about it, how much break in, and I'm sure it's going to be dependent on the cross hatch. And, and also I'm sure to a big extent, um, the ring material. Should I put in breaking oil? You don't need breaking oil on a hydraulic roller cam. The, the break-in oil is only for, the break-in oil is only for the, we just use regular oil on an LS. But if it makes you feel better, you could do that. And we've run, also, we've run lots of dyno testing on break-in oil. So we don't just put the break-in oil in there and break it in and then take the oil out. It, it, it's oil. It has oil pressure. It works fine.
I'm sure on race motors they are a little more conscientious about that. I've always just ran it how it was going to drive it on a break in. With hydraulic roll cam. Yeah, it, you, all, like I said, all you're breaking in are the rings. Gonna start to rebuild the Silverado dehybrid. Okay. Is, did the stream cut out? When I had the machine shoved to my head, it was, that's not good. If it's just changing a spring problem, that's easy to fix. Springs and lifters and cam. Oh my. That thing sounded like a, um, that thing sounded like it was electric. Oh, it is. That's an electric, electric diesel truck, electric big rig. Where's the dyno? Where's what dyno? The dyno's over in the in West Tech, but I, I don't get, um, unfortunately, I can't walk in there and do a run, which I'd like to do, but that would be cool to do the live feed in there, but there's just not service. My STS oil scavenge pump locked up this weekend. Uh-oh, I was blowing oil out of both ends of my turbo. Uh-oh, yeah, you don't like to see smoke. Yeah, what concerns me is the material that went through the engine, damaging the cam. Yeah, is the cam pretty chewed up? Yep, cordless vehicles, that's right. There should be a variable manifold in the aftermarket. Yeah, that would be cool. If only Super Richie would build something like that. I am going to build one like that. I, I mean, at least for the dyno test. I'm, it's not going to fit under the hood, but at least we'll be able to make it for the dyno. And the poll today is, should Richard build an adjustable manifold? You guys just have to let me know, yes or no. I'm wondering what would cause a scavenge pump to just seize up. Suppose I'll have to tear it apart. Um, usually, uh, if the pump seizes up, <coughs> foreign material usually is the problem. Richard, I can't find out how much I need to send for a cam. The cams are 169 shipped. So uh, send me an email, I'll give you all the details. When I sent you pictures of the heads, I will show you the picture of what I saw from the cam. Okay. Yeah, you, you really have to take that motor all the way apart and see if it got in the bearings. take the oil what we do is we take the oil filter off and then we cut the oil filter open because we have an oil filter cutter cutter opener and then we check the material in there funny bike you're up for a variable length intake i have a thing that i've drawn up cocktail napkin style because that's where all the best stuff comes from is uh, a sliding trumpet like the like the mazda which would be super cool. Because what you, what you find when you've tested this stuff a lot is that when you change the runner length, sometimes you can produce like, 
you produce like weird sine waves in the power curve and it goes up and down up and down up and down and actually if you if you overlay the shorter length and the longer length and those things overlay you get you get better you know smaller dips basically so you can have you can fill in the dips with a bump if you if you have those overlaid right so if you can, and what you do, what, and this is what they did back in the Formula One days when they were allowed sliding trumpets, is that they would cycle it just not like, not long for low end and short for high end. They they would cycle them during the RPM range. Pretty cool stuff. I mean, I, I won't be able to do that. <laughs> that That's a very, very intricate, expensive sliding mechanism that has to, and it has to be very fast reacting too. And theirs were, you know, 12, 15, 18,000 RPM motors too. It'd be neat if you could build or manifold those RPMs, climb the runners, collapse. They're not gonna collapse. They, they're just gonna, one's gonna slide inside the other basically. You'll just have two different diameter tubes, um, one inside the other. Yeah, Todd, just send yeah, just send me pictures. And it, Todd, is that a flat top piston six liter? With a two forty three head on it? Is that a fairly high compression thing and are you running it on E eighty five? More testing. I wish I could, while I was here, I wish I could throw that little V6 up. What a dirt bike fork tube would work as a runner. I don't, I don't really want to seal the runner. That's I should I should be able to just get slip fits. I, I might even be able to do it out of um, other kinds of thin wall tubing, maybe plastic or something. And it doesn't have to be an exact fit. There can, it's, I mean, as long as it's, as long as we don't mind a high idle, but, but while it's running at wide open throttle, that's not an issue. This is hearsay, but they use aircraft lever actuators like used on fighters to move aerodynamic surfaces, fly by wire stuff. I don't, I don't know what actuators they use, but it wouldn't surprise me that it came from very high end stuff. You ran pump gas, Todd? Okay. You're really most interested in the overall length. That that's what I'm that's what I care about. I like showing the change in runner length. LS7 lifters. It's more about the vacuum leak, but good point. It yeah, it the vacuum leak is only vacuum under under idle, under closed throttle stuff. The ideal situation would be to do that with a um, stack injection, like a Hillborn or something. Is the truck Norris a good cam for the LS, the one going swapped into the 96 Chevy? Yeah, it, it just depends on what the what the displacement is and what the intended use is. There are lots of great cams out there, um, as, as you can see from all the stuff that we've done. I like that cam profile for, you know, four eights and five threes. It's a really good combination of power and, and also drivability. It's not the most powerful cam, it's not, not by a long shot, but those more powerful cams come with side effects of, you know, drivability and idle quality and stuff. 
I got that from F1 Podcast. Yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they were using that because they have all the money and resources and they have a lot of sharp guys. They have a lot of engineers that do that stuff. So you would use stuff that, um, you know, would be the best thing and most reliable. And when you're talking about reliability, <laughs> reliability is critical on aircraft. I mean, it's important in a car, but it's critical on aircraft. So it's critical for forms of the money, the money that's involved, basically. Ugh, because of the expense. It's all expense. It's all money. It's a little bit nicer today. It's been raining the last couple of days, but now it's... Um, you know, the sun's peeking and getting behind a cloud right now, but it's, otherwise it's been really nice. I'm glad last night that, I mean, you know, we always got to look at the bright side. I'm glad last night when I was running that it was not raining. <laughs> it could have been a lot worse. And, and I could have been 10 miles away, not five miles away. See? It's always it's always a glass half full kind of thing. I'm going to try to I've got some mock-up stuff that I need to do. I'm going to check valve springs today on the V6 and hopefully on the Pontiac as well. I just need to get an idea of how much spring I need for a cam upgrade. And try to, while I'm down here, try to assemble the small block 400. The variable length runners of the Ferrari V10, used, they use pneumatic actuators? Okay. I've got a good book on the Ferrari stuff that were the, in the years that they were using that. But that's cool. Pneumatic probably would be faster the way that they're cycling it. So that makes sense. That's cool. It's all perspective. But the other thing I could do in addition to doing... Um, you could do a, a, I think I've gone 20 inches, but we could go way more, go all the way up to the ceiling almost <laughs> and get the thing to make, torque it, you know, <laughs> off idle. A long time since I decided to go on a five mile run and use a car now. I, I really wish I could have used my truck. M more for time than anything else. I mean, I, I run a lot, so I, I run a few times a week. So I take the dogs out and just want to, I've always told my kids, hey, I want to, why do you, why do you have mommy take you out somewhere in the country and drop you off? I'm like, well, she's taking me to the farm. But the real reason is one, I don't like running out halfway and then running back. You're just seeing the same thing. So if you just drive me out there and I run back, then I'm only seeing, you know, one way new stuff. And also... I, I just like the idea of being, if I if I am like this, if I'm ever stuck somewhere, that I, I know I could get there, you know? I know I got that. And you don't know that unless you do that and then go, okay, that situation ever comes up. I'm good. I, I could have just, you know, curled up in the back of my truck. <laughs> Hope that somebody would come help me. Yep, running to see all the good pizza. Now I run so that I can eat pizza. Although, like most people, um, I gained a bunch of weight um, during COVID and it kind of stayed there. For a while there, I was the heaviest that I'd ever been. So, um... I'm I'm getting that back off. Just like everybody. <laughs> K 
can't trade a junkyard 5.3 for meta my, your metabolism. Well, like everybody else, as you get older, your metabolism starts to go away. But, you know, working um, <laughs> working 20 hours is, helps your metabolism a lot. Especially after a 12-hour day and you lock yourself out of the car, lock yourself out of the shop and you go, oh, good, great. Now I got I to gotta go do a five-mile run. That's super cool. And then come back and then work until... Two o'clock or whatever, two thirty. That's a. I, I am a lot more active down. Well, well, I'm doing stuff more here than I am when I'm at home. Um, I have to force myself and to get out. And it's harder when it's raining and stuff. You know, you don't want to go out and run in the rain. But um, dirt, when it starts getting sunny, then it's all good because we take the dogs out hiking in the hills and stuff. Uh, I work for a locksmith. Yep. <clears throat> How do you guys deal with carb compliance, like all these cams? The, I, I'm doing dyno testing, so n none of the stuff that I do on the dyno has anything to do with that. If you're looking for an emissions legal cam, you need to search around and see if, see if guys have those. Pneumatic was apparently used because it was the highest, uh, the lightest since they already had an air pump on board. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So, Michael, you were the you were the opposite of that. I can see that happening, but only if you're if you make that decision that hey, look, I'm going to use this time to to go work out. COVID didn't really stop what I was doing because I was still I was still doing testing and I was still doing videos and stuff. So it's not like I, you know, couldn't go into my job. That's a nice thing about being in my room by myself <laughs> doing videos. Did does anybody know? Did they make on the V6s on the Vortec V6s? They didn't make carbureted hydraulic roller V6s, did they? I think that those are all flat tappet cams, right? Because I'd like to put a distributor. If I went into the wreck yard and got a distributor, like an HEI, then I could run it on that V6. But those distributors are all going to have the wrong gear in them. We could change the gear, I guess. But then I have to order a gear and I might as well just order a distributor. Yeah, Dylan, actually, uh, riding a bike is better for you than running. Running is very impactful. I can't believe how much of a difference there is in the muscles that you use riding a bike compared to running. It's dramatically different. I thought I was in pretty good shape and then I went for a ride with my wife who was doing... Um, sprint triathlons at the time. I'm like, oh yeah, this is this is a whole different thing. Truckstar makes a supercharger that bolts right because it bolts right onto a V8. It's the same it's the same blower. I have videos of that up running. I'm excited about running the Pontiac with the Torque Storm. And I'm excited about running Boost with the Dodge, too. Big Dodge Power, big Mo Power. So what's everybody else doing today? Back to work? My sons are off school. I wanna get back. 
go hang out. Go see my puppies. But it is cool to be on the dyno, except not, not the locking yourself out part so much. <laughs> That's not cool. Work, work, work. That's so we could that's so we could buy stuff for our cars. When I get back, I can get all of the parts that people ordered out and then I'll have what I'll do is I'll do some live feeds with a bunch of the used parts. We'll talk about those. You guys can decide if it, or and we'll do a live feed. I'll show what they are and guys can talk about where they want them. Started flower seeding while eating turkey soup. Totally away at the server mine. <laughs> if you make a bigger motor, then you can run a bigger camshaft in it and still have the same idle quality as a smaller cam on a smaller motor. And if you want to make more power in a bigger motor, then you would put a bigger camshaft in it. I remember guys doing what they called stroker camshafts, stroker specific camshafts, talking about changes in dwell time and stuff. But the reality is the change in displacement is what's doing that. And I've run lots of camshafts on small motors, medium sized motors and big motors. And you know, <laughs> makes more power on a bigger motor. I went to install my GT40 Cobra intake last night on my X303 Ford racing heads. Realized that the port is three quarter taller than the intake. Yeah, that that um, the X303 head should be bigger than the opening on that Cobra manifold. And really, do you do you need to port match that? Because you think that having the runner that size all the way through the intake manifold and then all of a sudden getting bigger at the port is going to change anything? I know it makes everybody feel better, but I, I would doubt you'd see any power. At least that's going the right way. At least the head port is bigger than... seen the curve change between standard displacement and a stroked motor same motor if you've done that test do you mean how does how does displacement change the power curve take a look at the video that i have up comparing the 48 and the 53 and the 60 and the 62 that'll show you what happens if you if you have the same components which is hard to do but they are the same on a 48 and 53 the smaller motor will make power at a little higher engine speed. It'll make a lot less average power than the bigger motor does. If you run the same heads, cam, and intake manifold and compression and just change the displacement, and in that case, you're changing it by the stroke. But actually, a similar thing will happen if you change the displacement you know, by bore size. However you do it, it's just the bigger motor. Bigger motors make more power. Got to get that D-stroke stuff. You never hear about anybody D-stroking a 5.3 <laughs> to, to a 4.8. But that's essentially what a 4.8 is. It's a D-stroke 5.3. I got a couple more minutes left and I got to get back to work. Do, do I want to stroke a junkyard magnum? No, I don't really. I think guys do 408s out of them, but we've I've done that a lot on different things. I would de-stroke an engine. I would too, and I have um, a couple of times now, but it, it always does the same thing. It doesn't make uh, more torque on the same power. Uh, a D-stroke engine makes less less horsepower and less torque. It makes less of everything. 
again, just a, a good example is look at the 4.8 and the 5.3. You, you can get to a point where if you keep going up in displacement, the motor becomes limited in its in its airflow potential with if you have, you know, stock kind of heads or a stock camshaft or stock intake manifold on it, you'll limit the power gains, but it'll add it'll just add a whole bunch more torque. And then because of the airflow potential of the things that you're applying to it, it can limit power. But that has nothing to do with the Born stroke. That just happens to be the the airflow limitation with a greater demand from the bigger motor. Just diving in here at the end, Richard, my exhaust inlet on my turbo is sectioned into two inlet ports. Okay, it's a divided housing. When I build my flange, do I need anything funky there? No, you just it doesn't matter. Just just buy an open flange for a T3 or T4 or whatever size turbo it is. So, Brian, you're throwing some math out there for us? What cam manufacturers do you recommend? For what? I don't have a cam manufacturer that that, that I like above all else. Um, I have cams. If you have an LS, I have cams available. So I recommend me. <laughs> but but Brian Tooley makes great stuff. I've known him for years. I, I've run Texas Speed stuff. I've run Cam Motion stuff. I've run lots of comp stuff. I've run Crane stuff, Isky stuff. I ran one Howard's cam, I think. I've run Elgin stuff. There's lots of good cams out there, and that's just nothing but good news for you because as a consumer, you want to have lots of choices. Yeah, Tristan, I have 5.3 truck cams. Yeah, it, Bob, it is good with an open flange. It's not going to make any difference. The only thing that guys might do on that is is run it totally divided, like run the exhaust from one side to one of those sides and run the exhaust from the other side of your V engine to the other side. But honestly, I don't think so. Uh, Noah, I do have a chopper copper, in, in fact. I have a used one that we did, did a bunch of testing with. I would only de-stroke an engine for high RPM build, like 9,000 or something. I, even then, I wouldn't do that. If, it, if, I was, if I was trying to make lots of power, a bigger non-de-stroked motor run to 9,000 RPM will make more power than a de-stroked one run to 9,000 RPM. Surprise all those good cams you have haven't sold out already. Well, I haven't been home. I haven't been home with all the cams yet. And people don't know what, what a lot of the used ones that I have are. Yeah, Bob, I we I don't ever do that. I, I have divided housings. I've run them a lot, and I just have an open flange. I just have the way that I run the turbos is that, like, on the setup that I have for the LS motors, I have the stock exhaust manifolds into a Y-pipe. The Y-pipe ends in a 3-inch V-band, and then I have adapters that go from that 3-inch V-band to a T4 or a T6 and they're all just open and I run them on divided housings and I'll guess what all the exhaust gets to the turbo and good things ensue. Figure I was leaving a little bit of power on the table, leaving the intake manifold port smaller than the head. Eventually I want to sell my Cobra intake and buy a system two. Yeah, the System X2 is good and so is the RPM2. Those are both good intake manifolds. Cams are a lot of work to swap. I don't think nearly as many people actually swap them. Um, on LS stuff, cam sales are huge. But yeah, you more people would do air intakes and maybe a cat back exhaust. I think even fewer would do headers. You know, the more involved it is, the, the fewer the people are going to do it. Why does a larger stroke increase power? Because you've made the motor bigger and bigger motors draw more air in and then they make more power. That's how they that's how they make power is they process air. So a bigger motor draws more air in. David, yeah, you are late. Uh, you only have about two minutes. <laughs> two more minutes. Then back to work. Actually, it's probably about lunchtime. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it is lunchtime. 
I've already, I've already made my list of what I need to do to the V6. Springs, can I use LS springs? Cam, rockers, intake, like a, a dual plane. Or, yeah, I, I have to write that too. Sniper. Fabricated. So I can make a tunnel rammy kind of thing out of a V8 one. Carburetor, distributor, head studs, ARP, blower, blower, and I guess we gotta put turbo on there too, right? Pure turbonium. What is this? Garbage. That's what I do. I make lists. And I check it off. I was actually happen, hoping to run the ATI damper, but I'm going to have to have that honed a little bit. I'm going to have to have the hub honed a little bit to get it on there. Then I can run a bigger bigger pulley on it. Although we're, I think we're already running it near 20,000 RPM running that little Eaton. I, th I, th I just think we're, I don't think we're blower limited. We would make more power down low. I just don't know what's going to happen at the top if we're getting into the restriction. Just needs a four inch, four inch. Crank is a lever, longer stroke applies. Longer stroke applies that same power to the longer lever over a longer distance. I, I don't think a mechanical advantage is the way that it's creating power. It it processes more air because the an internal combustion engine is just an air pump. So if you can get it to process more air, it makes more power. Why can't you rev the smaller stroke higher and get the same power? Well, but but a stroke isn't limiting RPM. So if you can run the bigger motor at the same RPM as the smaller motor, which you can, which is shown by every racing class that's ever been available, um, if you give engineers a um, displacement, they're going to run that displacement limit. So if you the where at very high levels of racing, they juggle bore and stroke, but they normally do that not for RPM potential. They do that for breathing potential. So if you make the bore bigger, you can make the head flow more. And if you can get to process more air, it will make more power. They're not doing it because they can't rev a longer stroke. They can rev a longer stroke. In fact, if you if you would allow them a longer stroke and, and more displacement, then they would make the motor bigger and it would make more power. What happened with battery cable saga? It's not concluded yet because <laughs> again I was there late last night and I didn't do the battery swap I'm going to go do the battery swap right now and then I will know tomorrow piston acceleration is a limiting factor <clears throat> I disagree with that because if you take a look at um, mountain motors and you calculate the stroke and you calculate the piston speed piston speed isn't um, something that people are really worrying about much anymore Rod ratio and piston speed changes can affect for sure. Okay. So a 4.8 has a longer rod than a 5.3 and, and makes less power. It has a better rod ratio <laughs> and it makes less power. And it makes less power because it's smaller. The big small thing is the big thing and rod ratio is a little thing. Yep, there, there we go. And on that note, it is time to go. I got to get back to work, uh, but I will see you guys all tonight.